Hey everybody and welcome to our session in Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be covering verses 1 to 6. And if you've ever wondered how to please God, the author has just told us the answer in the end of chapter 12, which we covered last time. He told us that we can truly but only please God when we serve and worship Him from a heart that is grateful for his grace to us in Christ. That alone is acceptable to God because it honors his grace above everything, including our works and everything else. It's all of his grace, and God accepts that. And in chapter 13 now, the author is continuing from that stream of thought to clarify for us what that kind of grace-fueled, grateful service looks like. And so here we're going to see that the author gives three traits of grateful saints so that we can enjoy a life that pleases God, which is just amazing. So as we get into this, uh, we're going to see three traits of grateful saints. And the first one comes in verses one to three. The first trait is that they love God's people. They love God's people. Just the first verse says, let the love of the brethren continue. Those who are in God's family. And the reason, the first reason I think he gives is because this characterizes the kingdom of God. And you ask, why would I say that? This word here, continue, is the same word used in the very end of chapter 12. It's two sentences away. And in chapter 12, he says that In the end, God will, like an earthquake shakes a city and knocks every building down except that which can remain, God will shake everything in creation until only that which is ultimately characterized as Christ's kingdom will remain. And then two sentences later, we come to this verse and he says, let the love of the brethren remain. Same word, or continue, the idea of Endure. I don't think it's an accident that he uses the same word. And the reason for that is in the context that you can see that when you experience this kind of love, this kind of supernatural grace-fueled love of the brethren, of God's people, you're experiencing what it will be like in the kingdom of God when he makes everything right. And so that's a, that's a big picture view of this love of the brethren. And with that big picture, he calls you in a command to let it remain, to welcome this, to preserve this, to have an active pursuit of the well-being of the love, that this would be a healthy kind of love that characterizes the Christian community because there's all sorts of dangers to it. So don't let anything tell you that this is unimportant or non-essential. If you're fighting with someone in the body or you're afraid to help someone in the body because of what it might do to your reputation or whatever it is, there are all sorts of things that want to destroy and corrupt this. Satan does not want the love of the brethren to continue because this love among the members of God's family sends a message to the world about God that he loved us. And that's why Jesus said that he intends that the world learn of him through the love of his people. And Satan does not want that. And so the author knows that and says that whatever threatens this, make sure that this love endures. And this love is then explained and clarified for us more specifically in the next two verses. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is in verse 2. And this is because this love is a way of showing that we've welcomed in our hearts God's blessing and God's message. As we read this, it says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, because by this, by the hospitality to strangers, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now this word for hospitality is literally the same root word for this love. It's just the love of strangers There's the love of the brethren and the love of strangers. The implication is in the context, I believe, that these strangers are brethren whom you don't know. Now, 
this is an interesting section because uh, there's some a lot of wordplay here with this neglect and not knowing it, and then this hospitality and this entertainment. Um, but without getting carried away into that, uh, what's important here is that he says, because by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. And in the book of Hebrews, the word angel means messenger. Messenger. They brought a message and blessing to their hosts. You can think of, for this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. You might think of Abraham. Abraham was ignorant of the fact that he was housing angels in his home. And, but the author of Hebrews is saying, don't be like that. Do not neglect showing hospitality. In fact, pursue this because it's a way of welcoming God's people, God's messengers. Why? Because, well, in the biblical era, the way you treated a messenger of someone was the way you treated that someone. That was understood. That's why Jesus in John 13 says, If someone receives my disciples, they receive me. You see, it's an expression of your heart towards God. This not neglecting to show love to strangers and hospitality is an expression of your heart towards God. And so we see that those who have received Christ's gospel into their hearts will be those who receive Christ's people into their homes, even those whom they don't know. You, you see, your love for the brethren up here is whether they're strangers or not. And that just shouts to the world that God has brought many to be his children, more than you can know. And, we're, and yet we're all unified in his family, and our unity is deep and spiritual, as the author describes for us now in verse 3, which is our third point, that we should have love for God's people because believers are united. It says, remember the prisoners as those in prison with them. And in chapter 10, it talks about this as well, and that these are believers, as those in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also in the body. And so the idea is when a brother or sister suffers, that matters to you. You're called to remember them. And I want to focus in on this word here. This remembering pleases God. Remember, he's talking about service that pleases God. This remembering of them pleases him. Why? Because in Hebrews, this term illustrates, well, this, this remembrance illustrates for the world how God remembers us. This word, remember, is used in chapter 2 of God remembering man in his fallen state and in his sin. And it communicates his care and his compassion for us. And so when you were suffering and in need, God did not forget you. And if God is that way to us, and we receive his grace, that should overflow into our lives, and our lives will showcase that same kind of care in our relationships to our brothers and sisters. In other words, your brother and your sister matter to you. They're significant to you. They're a factor in your thinking, and they come into your mind often. They're not easily forgotten, but they're remembered, as the author would encourage us. Moreover, you're to feel for them. As he says, remember the prisoners in such a way as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also in the body. You're to have sympathy with them. And the idea of sympathy is common in Hebrews, where Christ, your priest, feels and sympathizes with your pain and knows the pressures that you face. In that way, you're to feel for each other as if you were in their shoes, whether they're prisoners or ill-treated or whatever it is. This is really loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And ultimately, what's going on in their life changes what's going on in your heart, in your feeling toward them. You're not unfazed when you hear something happen to them. You can't manufacture this kind of authentic sympathy, though. Remember, in the context, 
This is when you understand God's grace to you. This is what arises in your heart naturally, as the author of Hebrews says. And he's just guiding us into greater and greater expressions of that. And you see a brother or sister in need, as John says in 1 John, you don't close your heart to them. You don't push them out of your thoughts. You push toward them. You ask yourself, what would I need if I were in that person's shoes? That's a key question. How would I want to be loved if that were me? And then you do that for them. Because Christians are not to be forgotten by other Christians. Because Christians are not forgotten by God. And when you've received grace, your life will showcase a great love for God's people. And God's pleased with that. And beyond people, even, uh, the author goes on to describe how um, a Christian who's grateful for God's grace will have a love for God's purity as well. And this is our second point. The things that reflect God's purity will be valued by believers. This is verse 4. Now it says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. You see, marriage is among the purest expressions of love that humans are capable of. God created this to be just a major theater of love. And in seeing a pure marriage, we can see so clearly how Christ loves his church, his bride. That's the point Paul makes in Ephesians 5. And the purity of our marriages say something about the purity of our God who created marriage. You see how that works. And the author calls believers to love this expression of God's purity because, well, number one, it's precious to God. You see, this word for honor here, this word for honor is the word used for something that is precious. It's something that's respected for its value. It's something that's prized. This is worth something. Marriage is valued by God. And so marriage should be valued by us. And so like anything valuable, we should protect it from distortion and abuse. Because that will diminish the value of God in the eyes of the world. And we need to protect this. And notice it says, the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Undefiled. That term is used of Jesus Christ himself earlier in Hebrews. That he is undefiled. Which communicates that it's 100% free from impurity. That's how... Strictly, we should guard the purity of this expression of our love as human beings, as God's people. And that matters to us also because with its value, we see secondly that it is serious to God. It is serious to God, as he begins to say in the last part of this verse. Now, if we dishonor what God honors, and if we devalue what God values... What he says is that judgment awaits us. If we jump in with the culture and treat marriage like it's made of Play-Doh and that can, it can be reshaped to be whatever you want it to be, this text really does sober us up to the consequences of that kind of thinking. You see here, it says, fornicators For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And you see here that he's not just talking about married people. Don't just think this is about married people. And that if you're not at that stage in life yet, that this doesn't affect you. You see, marriage is the key theater that displays Christ's love in a human institution, in a human way. And so that's what he's addressing. But what he's addressing is any kind of physical impurity that doesn't get expressed in God's ordained institution of marriage. You see, and I know this because it says fornicators. Fornicators are those who have physical immorality of any form outside of marriage. And adulterers covers the other end of the spectrum. This is physical immorality of someone who is within side 
inside marriage. This covers everything and shows us how serious this is to God because this judgment that's described here is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 6 and says, neither fornicators nor adulterers or any, and it just goes on and on and says, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, in the end of chapter 12, the author has said, you're inheriting the kingdom of God. And so, with that, we should protect the purity of God's design. When we're grateful for God's grace, we will love and seek to protect whatever expression of God's purity is out there, especially marriage and the way in which we live. Whatever expression of God's pure love, that should be valued and prized and protected by us. And so lastly, and our last point here, grateful believers showcase a tremendous love of God's provision. They love God's provision for them in verses 5 and 6. But what's this look like? To love God's provision. Now look here. Let's just read it. Verse 5, it says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Because for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You see, you're not supposed to be ruled by a sinful discontentment and a love for money. That's why he says, make sure that your character, this is the way in which you live, the the path of your life. Make sure that that does not have the love of money. Make sure that this love is not guiding you on your path of life. You're not to try to find security in the abundance of your possessions. When you think of material possessions, whatever it is, your stuff, your provisions, God instructs us elsewhere in Scripture saying all of that is uncertain. Something happens in the economy, it's gone. Yet our world trusts in money for protection and security. And you can buy your way out of trouble. You can buy your way out of suffering. These are the the false promises of money. You can pay your way into a peaceful life. Those are the promises of money. You see, money talks to you. It tempts people with the promise of security. But the reality is that you might be rich today and poor tomorrow. But real security is not promised and found in riches Real security is promised and found in God. And that is why we can be so, as he says, content with what you have. So content with whatever we have because of the promise of God. And this is here in verse 5. The promise of God because he himself has said. He himself has said. Why can you be content? Because... God has said. So money talks, God talks too. Praise the Lord. Because you're actually rich is the answer. Why can you be content? You're actually rich. Notice he contrasts God with money. Being content with whatever God has for you rather than chasing after money. If you have God, you're actually rich. What he's getting at is the fact that if anything is more valuable to you than God, if you love anything more than God, if you love money, for example, and you're not content with the fact that God says, I will never leave you, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That is his promise. So if you have a little, if you're content with whatever you have, just a little, and you also have God's presence, you are rich. If you love anything more than God, it's ultimately because you don't have an understanding of the value of grace that's yours. The value of God's grace to you. You see, this whole text is is a life that pleases God because of His grace. 
And that's expressed when whatever we have physically, materially, we're content with that because we also have God. And yet contentment is not this lack of love. It's actually love of what you have in God. It's saying, don't go after money. Just enjoy what you have in God. Enjoy the fact that God is with you. That is greater riches than the money of the world. You actually have more. You see, a little with God is far better than a lot of that money without him. Because God is enough. That's a message the world needs to hear. You'd rather have this relationship with God than chase riches. He's enough. He's promised you eternity with him in his kingdom. And he's promised you his help and care every single day until you get there. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So can't we be content then in whatever he provides for us today materially and tomorrow and the next day? This is why Christians love God's provision. Moreover, the last thought is not only do we love it because of the promise of God that is greater riches than than money, but in verse 6, we love it for the praise of God, that it allows us to speak forth. Because the love of God's provision makes God look really good. It it shows that he's of greater value to us than, than everything else. And that's what Christians want to live for, that kind of a message. It puts him and his value and his power and his care on display for everyone to see. And so day in and day out, if God gives you a lot, you praise him. And if God gives you a little, you praise him. And if people come in and steal your stuff in persecution, like exactly what happened to these readers... And it was referenced in chapter 10. Those people are buying a ticket to see God show off his worth in your response to that circumstance. They thought they would devastate you. And yet, like those believers, you have joy. They thought they'd instill fear in you. But you're absolutely unafraid and at rest. They thought by taking your stuff, they'd intimidate you. But you have an authentic confidence. And when they hear you speak, they don't hear you trying to impress them with your wise ideas of how to bounce back in worldly ways. They don't hear you talk about your backup plans. No. They hear you speak from confidence in in verse 6 here. So that you can confidently say, The Lord Yahweh is my helper. And because of that truth, which is promised to me, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, this is God showing off in his people's need. This is the message that the world needs to hear. And this whole text is saying that it only comes from those who are grateful for, the, for God's grace given to them in Christ. This is a message of, of how to showcase God and how to showcase His grace through your life. It's through a love of God's people, a love of God's purity in any way it's expressed, and a love of God's provision because of what it shows about the value of God. So I I hope this helps you get a better feel of what a grace-filled and grateful life looks like in practical ways. And we'll hope to look at more of these next time.